Hello, my name is Lucian Stroi. I'm from Romania. Currently, I'm uh, working in a bank as an agile coach, but I have been working in, in and out of software since 10, 12 years ago, mostly in testing. Uh, my talk is also a bridge between agile and uh, testing. It's a talk about Kinefin and uh, how can Kinefin help us uh, as testers choose our test strategy or test approach depending on the context and the uh, stage where we are in the pipeline and the delivery cycle. Okay, thank you. Hello everybody. Uh, once again, my name is Lucian, I'm from Romania. And uh, I'm here to talk about uh, options of choosing our test approach. First of all, I would like to know how many of you have heard or read about Kinefin before? Okay, quite a few. So this is quite good, I guess. Um, I will my uh, talk is uh, structured like this, showing uh, what Kinefin is about, a short link between testing and then how and uh, which testing approach can be used in uh, various contexts. Uh, but first of all, let's try with something really, really basic, I believe, for every testers. What is a tester's role? Why do we test? And uh, I, I encountered this question something like eight years ago, and uh, I had a friend of mine who put a book on my desk and said, read this book. I looked at the publishing date, it was something like 60s, 70s, and I said, okay, that's a really old book. And it's a book from Jerry Weinberg, it's called Software, uh, perfect software and other illusions about testing. I recommend you heavily this book because it opened my eyes. Because the, it opened my eyes because it changed the way I perceived the role of the tester. It's not to execute tests, it's not to, how should I say, follow some scripts, do reports and stuff like that. The tester's role in the organization is to provide information, to provide information for those that need to take decisions. Rarely we are in the decision-making position, so most of the time we are just providing support for people to take decisions. All the findings we are doing is on that. How do we provide information? Mostly like geologists do, we sample things. We sample and we try to find out, read out the samples. Think about it like, okay, what is this sample test telling me? It's telling me that the application is working or not working, okay? And um, like geologists, we need to fine tune and choose our approach based on the context. It's one way wh when uh, you are um, sampling and trying to find out how the soil is for a, a highway in a plain and how it is uh, on in the mountains. You use different strategies, you use different ways of sampling because the context is different. And um, context is everything. How many of you can read Braille? We don't need to because most of us are not heavily vision impaired. But Braille in this scenario is useless. Uh, it's a good tool, but it's in the wrong context. That's because context demands consideration. We need to choose and think about the context when uh, we choose our tools, our test approach, and uh, our way of working. Okay, what do we have in mind when we consider context and approach? We think about time to market, we think about complexity, we think about effort, we think about novelty, we think about expected lifespan, and some of us think about automation. This, uh, the idea behind this talk came to me two or three years ago, three years ago, when I was working in, uh, in an agency environment. And uh, in that agency environment, we were delivering uh, nicely, very polished uh, sites for um, high demanding customers that uh, are, uh, I don't know, we are using their products mostly every day. Something like Google, Microsoft, uh, Samsung, and so on. And um, those uh, products that we were delivering were very short-lived. They were... Um, very good on quality, they had to be very good on quality, but they were quite short-lived. They were short projects that were quite intense and tried to achieve very well-defined targets. And in our context, we uh, 
the managers were pushing for automation. Why? Everybody does automation. We need to do automation. We need to jump in the automation bandwagon. And I tried, I, I didn't feel like it. I didn't feel like it because our goal was not automation. So in my situation, in that context, the goal was not automation. I'm not saying that all contexts are the same. This is my view, my experience that I'm sharing with you. And um, when supporting this uh, point of view, I thought, okay, it's my word against their word. Good. How, how do I approach this? How do I work it out so that uh, I get a, how should I say, believe, easy to believe message? And um, I like to believe that uh, there are few things in the world that we need to reinvent. There were people long before me who, who did a, a lot of basic research, foundation research, and uh, some of them are uh, Dave Snowden and Liz Kyo. They are two of the persons I look up to. They, uh, Dave uh, worked out on, um, on a model that I'm going to present uh, to you earlier, uh, later on. Um, he's a very proud Welsh guy. This is why I have here the Welsh dragon. Um, so, Kinefin. Enter Kinefin. It's uh, a sense-making framework. It's a tool or call it whatever you want. For It's a helping hand for determining the context. And um, what is sense-making? Sense-making is uh, an approach where you take data first as opposed to all other frameworks that uh, we are, I, I was accustomed to. Most of the frameworks assume that you have data formatted for them. Kinefin works the other way around. We have reality. Reality happens every day. It's hit, it hits us with data and with information. You cannot afford to, let's say, format and translate uh, the information reality throws at you in order to fit some fancy framework or some, uh, I don't know, any other model. And uh, Kinefin says, okay, let's admit reality is happening and have data. Uh, in this framework, we have uh, five quadrants, like Dave likes to call them. In the middle, we have uh, what is called disorder. It's that deep pit where you don't want to be. Then, on the, on the front, we have something like uh, there is order. There is order somewhere. In the obvious part, in the obvious part, there is uh, um, there are best practices, and you have uh, the approach for uh, solving problems is like you sense, categorize, you sense the problem, you categorize it, and you respond. The spaces of solution and problems are very well connected. The connections are visible. Then in complicated, the spaces are well visible, but the connections are not so well visible. Going, moving into complex, into complex you have the problem space, good defined, well defined, but the solution space is not that well defined. This is where most of our knowledge work is happening. This is where things like Scrum, Agile, and, uh, and, and, and these buzzwords and uh, frameworks that are uh, now on the rise are uh, having um, their intended way of usage. And in chaos, in chaos there are no constraints. Neither the problem nor the solution is known. Here, what I believe it's to do, to be done, it's like, okay, get out of there as fast as you can because uh, you, you, you cannot uh, live there long. What it means for, uh, for testers? Um, I, I, I researched a little bit before and there were other, let's say, people before me doing uh, this, uh, the looking into this. So uh, Duncan Isbet and uh, Johan Hoberi uh, did this. So in, we, have, we can uh, split it out in two. We, it's, we have uh, order domain where we have more order and one we, where we have less order. Think about it in your space. Where are you? Then, depending on this, in the order domain, you can increase control. It is there where management lives. In the less orderly domain, it's where you need creativity. You need to boost creativity because you need to find out new ways of doing things. This is where leadership lives. This is where um, people need to find new ways of approaching things. 
And once you have, once you determined order and or not so order, uh, orderly, uh, where, when you define your approach to, how should I say, running things, you control them or you lead them, then you can uh, think about using or reusing existing work or exploring and producing new work. This is how, how, our, how I see testing uh, moving on, balancing, switching between these two, these two fields. Um, going on the simple side. On the simple side, we have a lot of order. Control is something that is um, the way of doing things, managing, and where we can use or reuse things. Uh, we categorize problems uh, initially and or, or analyze them in order to, to find the most suitable solution. Uh, on the other side, on the other side, we probe for problems where we don't have order and uh, where leadership is supposed to exist. We explore. Exploration is probing. Exploration is finding new ways of doing things. And that's the complete picture. Um, good. That would be, let's say, the basic intro part in what Kinefin is. Uh, okay. We are at a testing conference. Why is this guy talking about so much about leadership, management, control, reuse, and so on? Because it's not that we are living in a disconnected world. Uh, many, uh, practices, ideas are circulating between fields, and we can, we, can learn, uh, uh, we can learn and use them in our context. And this is what I used for uh, supporting my, uh, my, my case for not going into the automation bandwagon. Uh, Liz uh, did a research on, um, did a, had some ideas about uh, complexity. How do you estimate things based on this? Uh, when you are in the obvious context, everybody knows about it. It's well known. Everybody in the world did it. It's not like you need to reinvent it. You can automate it. You can automate it to the end and you can reuse or even buy solutions already done because it's commodity. It's commodity and it's where you use automated checks that are easy to comprehend, easy to reproduce. You do not have problems. You do not have surprises. It's a well-known field. It's like this stage th here. I know it. I can see it. It's, I know there are no holes, no dangers in there, so I can think about some methods of per going through it. Uh, smoke tests, unit testing goes into this. You have a lot of control. It's not that you don't uh, have control or do not know where you are. Okay? Then we move in the, towards complexity, increasing it. We move in the complicated context. In the complicated context, things are knowable. In the obvious context, they were known. Okay? Everybody knew them. They are known. They are facts and you know them. Here, they are knowable. Knowable means that you can learn about them. You can find them out. Um, somebody in your company did it. Somebody in your team did it. It's not you. It's someone else. Uh, in the complicated context, in the complicated context, you do manual scripted testing or acceptance testing. Or you have a set of tests that are um, defined in a more general way, and you apply some parameters on them based on your on your scenario. Um, it's uh, something like uh, the uh, speaker before me. They are doing they their level design. It's something complicated. It's it's a it's a fairly well known quantity that they know how to explore and how to think about it. Um, acceptance testing is, is I, I see it here, in also user acceptance testing. Then uh, we move on in um, complex domain. In complex domain, somebody in the world knows it. There is no one in their company that has done it, or possibly in the, some more extreme scenarios, nobody in the world did it. It's novelty. It's where you invent things, where you come up with new things of new ways of doing things. Uh, here you discover and inno innovate. Uh, most of the um, disruptors or trendy things are happening here. 
it's very difficult to innovate in obvious or complicated domain. There things are already known. Here, I believe, and uh, also some other people believe, exploratory and session-based testing is, is the, the way to go. Uh, exploratory testing means, you know about it? So exploratory and session-based testing go hand in hand. Uh, it's going and finding out things without having a manual or script. It's where human judgment is very important. It's where real, the real difference between a tester and a developer is happening. Because in, in, when, explo in, when exploring, the testers have a different mindset than developers. Developers explore in a little bit different way than testers explore. And that, that's because they have uh, some mental biases, some, uh, they are somehow more contaminated with their, uh, with their work and they, they look on the sunny side. Testers, on the other hand, tend to look on also on the dark side and uh, think about, okay, what can possibly go wrong with this and how do I find it out? In chaos, in chaos, you don't know where you are. Um, in chaos, nobody has done it. You don't know if you have a problem or not. Um, what's the approach here? I don't know. As I said, in chaos, you just try to switch out of this environment and escape, let's say, to one of the others. You can try to go to obvious context, you can try to go to complex, complicated, do whatever you do you can in order to, how should I say, find a firm ground. I, I recently saw a nice video about uh, what happens when you put sound waves into sand. It transforms into a liquid. That's somehow what, what chaos looks like. You, you cannot stand on it. I cannot work on water. I cannot work on water. So it's, it's like this. trying to work on water. It's uh, a little bit like chaos. Um, but that is, so far I have talked about uh, statics. So I know where I am and I know what to apply. But static is deadly. Static is like knowing where you are, but not knowing where you are heading to. And dynamics are much more important in, uh, in this uh, field. The context is fluid. Contexts are fluid. It's not like they are set in stone and lasting so long. You, the context, uh, changing context is happening all the time. It implies action from us to change the context, or they can happen without action from us naturally. Contexts are shifting. And um, change of context in uh, the Kinefin way of working requires change of practice. If the context is changing and you are not changing the practice, guess what? You do not have a fit. And if you are applying the wrong practice in the wrong context, you will not get the expected or needed or wanted for results. You would soon fall out in, uh, and uh, lose control. Um, the one that uh, nobody wants to be in, chaos. How do you get in chaos? Uh, from obvious to collapse or lose of, lose of control. There is that uh, little circle over there. Uh, some people uh, call it cliff of complacency, cliff of, cliff of uh, self-comfort. When you lose control, you get into chaos for a brief period until you regain it. Or you remain there and everybody, everything collapses on you. Uh, from complex, you lose, you get out of complex through either gaining or losing control. Uh, or, or sorry, or in chaos. To either losing or gaining control. And um, that's where you, I wouldn't want to be. Then, from complex to complicated. In complex, we know that we are uh, exploring. And uh, exploit is, means to me getting a set of things that are, how should I say, that are uh, known and are um, applicable repeatedly, and I find a pattern. When I find a pattern, I can exploit it and move into complicated. I can simplify the problem. I can cut out all the parts that are not so relevant, that are not so important for that situation, 
simplify and then move to complicated where I know how to, where I can deal with it and apply some other things. Think about where you have, you receive a new build. You receive a new build uh, from a software that you tested before, but there are a lot of new features. First of all, most of us, I don't know about you, but I explore a little bit. What are these features about? How do they behave? I explore. I try to find out a mental image of the feature. Then I try to uh, put myself in the shoes of the user. Uh, how would a normal person use this? It's a simplification step. Okay, I try to find out, okay, the normal user wouldn't do this and that and that and that. I put those limits and then I can script it. I can script it and build a short script and uh, put it in some automated uh, test uh, suite and so on. I can make it more repeatable. This is what exploit means, exploit, explo exploit of the known uh, constraints. Uh, then I have, when you explore, you get out of the complicated. I, I cut out, I open the box. Earlier I put things on a box, I limited them. And then I go out in, uh, co uh, from complicated, I have the box and I open it. I try to change things around them. I try to change things and um, um, tweak with them. Think about, okay, what would happen if I go too much in that direction? Or what would happen if I add too, much, too many users? How would the system behave? Exploration happens in complex environment. I, it's, it's difficult to script it. It's difficult to uh, make it repeatable. It's, you know, it's innovation and finding new ways of doing things. And um, from complicated to obvious, most of the ways you go to standardization. So you standardize things. Uh, once a test suite is run hundreds of times and it never fails, you take it uh, like, okay, that's the test that never fails. It's a test that it's, I call it the most useless test. The one that never fails gives me no information. It gives me no learning. I can put it in obvious. I can buy it. Some, some, sometime, or I can sell it to some other people because it's not so, uh, not so useful for me. It's standardized and uh, I can move on. Okay, and um, wrapping it up. Wrapping it up, my goal was to find out how to maximize the value delivery. So in my case, it was how to maximize the amount of information that I was telling, that I was putting out to decision makers. How did I get that maximized? Uh, in, by adapting the practice to my context. Um, another thing that I would like you to take out uh, from this session, don't lose track. Don't lose track of the goal and target. Why are you doing what you are doing? Don't lose track of your test effort. Why am I testing? Am I testing to fill out a report? Then one approach is good. Am I testing for uh, automation? Then I need to go in that direction. Am I testing for to provide information? How do I provide the maximum amount of information? I don't know. It's your context, it's your situation that you need to really think about it. Be open-minded. Be open-minded and ready to admit the real context. It's, it's easy to say that, yeah, I'm comfortable where I am now and uh, things will not change. It's false, it's a sense, it's a trap. Things are changing. Be very aware of, okay, how things are changing. Things are changing not suddenly. There is a nice anecdote about uh, project management. How does a project, is, how does a project gets delayed one year? One day at a time. This is how testing also gets shifted. How it gets shifted? One feature, one little adaption, one little change in the context of the environment, one little new technology coming out. So it's the little things that are moving on. Uh, we saw earlier talk about, uh, talk about uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, artificial intelligence is not a new thing. It's, again, 60s, 70s theory applied to different to, to our times. But little things improved over time and here we are. And th this, this can be this, the, the example, this can, we can extrapolate this to many other things. 
So be open-minded and ready to admit your real context. It might not be comfortable. It not might be the one that you are, you are waking up every day and say, ah, oh, this is my context. Hmm, you might have surprises. Context defines the practical approach, not the other way around. If you have a practice, consider it. Is this practice good for the context I'm working on? I have seen a lot of automation projects fail because the, the software was not ready for automation. The software the under test was not uh, designed to be automated. And in this situation, it happens. It's not that everybody can or should do automation. Think about it and uh, think about, okay, what's the best one for me? The world is moving. So is our context. Adapt your change to the context, not the other way around. And um, I finished up a little bit early because I competing, I'm competing with lunch. It's a tough competition. 